Good morning and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Bethany Doherty and I am a program coordinator for OneOp. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's session on diabetes management for patients experiencing food insecurity. In case you are joining us for the first time, I would like to give a brief tour of our webinar platform so you can find your way around. Hopefully you are currently able to view the slides we are sharing. If you are unable to see them or have any other difficulties, please email us at contact at oneop.org for tech support. If you would like, um, please share where you're joining from in the chat pod. We look forward to having you join us for conversation and questions later on in the presentation. To embed the chat pod so you don't miss any links or conversations, simply place your cursor over the shared slides. You will then see a toolbar pop up across the bottom of your screen. From there, just click the chat bubble icon. When typing questions or comments, please be sure to select everyone from the response options drop down menu so everyone can view them in the chat pod. Please note that the slides and resources are available for download on the event page for today's session. We will be covering continuing education information at the end of the webinar, so please stay tuned at the end if you're interested in continuing education credits or need a certificate of attendance. And finally, closed captioning is available for this webinar. You can turn on the subtitles via the Zoom toolbar. Thank you for joining us as we continue our partnership with the Department of Defense and the U.S. Department of Agriculture to expand the readiness, knowledge, and networks of the professionals supporting our military service members and their families. Did you know that among our nation's active duty service members and their families, an estimated 24% are food insecure? In June, OneOp hosted the Military Family Readiness Academy series titled Military Families and Food Security, A Call to Action, which focused on the specific context of food security and military families. The Academy's programming includes a self-paced course and on-demand events with experts, all of which provide free continuing education credits for a variety of professions. We will put the link to the Academy in the chat pod. In today's webinar is part of OneOps Food Security and Focus Programming Collection. We recognize that food security is a complex issue, and to complement the Academy programming, OneOp is offering a series of live and on-demand webinars addressing a variety of food security topics, such as today's webinar. As part of our food security and focus programming, we are presenting a brief video on using the two-question food insecurity screening assessment. These questions are intended to identify at-risk service members and families so that they may be connected to programs that can help. As you begin engaging in conversation and assessing a service member's current food security, recognize that food insecurity can occur whenever there is stress on resources in a household time or money. The key is to start the conversation, perhaps at a morning stand-up, during a feedback session, or any time you may meet with your service members. The USDA defines food security for a household as the means to access by all members at all times to enough food for an active, healthy life. Food insecurity is defined as the limited or uncertain availability of nutritionally adequate and safe foods, or limited or uncertain ability to acquire acceptable foods in socially acceptable ways. Food insecurity may not always be visible, and asking families about food security may feel intrusive, but it is important to identify families who are food insecure or at risk for becoming food insecure so they may be connected to services. When meeting with families, you might say, the issue of not having enough food or the type of food you need to do your mission is a real concern. There are two proven questions to help understand if you are dealing with food insecurity. I would like to ask them now. If the answer to either question is yes, I want to get you connected to resources that can help, depending on your situation. Please know that food insecurity is just as common for single service members as for married service members. To screen for food insecurity, ask if the following two statements are often true, sometimes true, or never true. Within the past 12 months, we worried whether our food would run out before we got money to buy more. Within the past 12 months, the food we bought just didn't last and we didn't have money to get more. A response to either question of often true or sometimes true can indicate potential food insecurity. 
It is important to understand why the potential exists in order to connect the service member with appropriate resources. You could say, I have some resources I want to share with you that can help get you the support you need. To find resources, please visit militaryonesource.mil and find the Economic Toolkit for Service Providers. Scroll down and click on the ACT button to download a PDF of food security resources and programs. If the service member gives a response of never true, you may say that food may become an issue in the future, especially during a move or other transitions. Please reach out or call Military One Source if you need support. If the service member or family is on an installation, you can also suggest they reach out to their military and family support center. After a service member seeks out additional assistance, continue to follow up on their progress and the resolution to barriers affecting their financial well-being. Today, I am very pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Bailey Cooper. Bailey is the owner of Rural Health Dietitian and a clinical remote dietitian. Bailey completed her doctorate in exercise science and nutrition at North Dakota State University with a dissertation titled Barriers and Strategies to Optimize Diabetes Management in Emerging Adults with Type 1 Diabetes. Bailey has been a dietitian for eight years and has focused on improving diabetes care and nutrition in rural communities. During her doctorate work at North Dakota State University, Bailey served as a research dietitian on the Healthy Aging Research Team who focused on muscle quality and strength with animal-based protein intake. In her spare time, Bailey enjoys spending time with her horses running and yoga. And so I will now turn it over to Dr. Cooper to start the webinar. Good morning. All right, let's jump in. Um, I'm very passionate about this topic and super excited to share some of my experiences, which may look a lot different than y'all's as you're in various parts of the world and the country. Um, but I am also the daughter of an individual with type 1 diabetes, and I have a cousin. Um, my dad's nephew has type 1 diabetes. So very personal for me um, is I'm a professional and continue to work with patients and others with diabetes and um, looking specifically at food security and insecurity. So I really, um, whenever I approach patients or research for that matter with um, individuals with diabetes, I always think, um, how would it feel to walk a mile in their shoes? So we're really diving in today on um, how the standards of care with diabetes has been revised. And then on top of that, adding the layer of those who also live with food insecurity. So food insecurity, even though we've defined it already, we're really thinking, if you want to wrap your mind around, it's not only that we're lacking food, right? We're also lacking in other resources. It could be um, living, it could be other, you know, living expenses, physical expenses. Um, so we're really thinking about our social organization um, rather than just resources of financial means, okay? Um, and then some of the research we're going to dive into as well, looking at how that relates to diabetes health, also takes these other factors into consideration. So the U.S. Department of Agriculture really defines that for us, but we're going to add some layers to this as well. So the biggest thing we want to overly analyze and jump into, the faster that we can provide this assessment for our patients and um, our service members is we want early assessment. And I love that video pointed out that we really need to be active and have the conversation get started. Um, however, research shows that because food insecurity and diabetes is so high, we're thinking about the layers that can progress with diabetes health. So diabetes stress, really we define it in research as the overwhelming feeling of having diabetes. Um, everything that diabetes entails from um, pharmaceuticals to nutrition 
to um, just technology management, the overwhelming feeling that I I won't be able to do this on my own. Um, my doctors are going to define me as unhealthy, even though I'm struggling. So we're really diving into kind of this full faced d- distress, which then leads to those that are higher risk for distress also leads to depression. So the full on diagnosis of depression We do see a lower adherence to medication, which is very understandable as far as some of this is, you know, related to low economic status. And then on another layer, right, is our higher A1C values. So um, A1C, when we're going to look at the revisions, the A1C is an average of three months of blood glucose and does show us a really definite number on diabetes health, but it is just a number, right? There are various factors that we look in where we're understanding our patients with diabetes. So on the right side, we'll see some tools on top of that two questions, um, the two question survey. The two question survey definitely has um, researchers shown time and time again, it has the highest sensitivity. So it's going to show us very quickly. And then it has the highest specificity specificity (laughs) Um, when we're understanding our our service members with food insecurity. However, these are just other tools and we have links for resources with those, but this kind of dives in and maybe can target some other areas. And if you do have time, um, there are, you know, if you, you hear, find a yes to either of those questions, maybe you want to add another layer or you have um, different non-English speakers, which we're going to discuss as well today. And so those are options that are highly researched and they're from the USDA. So those are just extra tools that we wanted to provide um, while we're looking at this topic. So again, the two questionnaire and very short and simple, but it just kind of gives us a a glimpse on what we're looking at as far as the the, um, food insecurity. Um, But First thing, we do this with all of our patients that I work at the hospital now and my clients is um, just dive into it early. I think the earlier we discuss this topic, um, and the good thing about working with others is they may not themselves struggle with food insecurity, but they may know others who also struggle with food insecurity. So it really kind of adds a layer of we're helping the community, even if it's not the service member one-on-one, um, they, well, oh, I didn't know there was resources available. So it really kind of turns that light bulb on and it makes it less um invasive when we start that conversation early, similar to some of our other difficult topics. Um, And granted, you know, we're adding in a cultural layer as well, but um, the more we can discuss this, the better and the faster early on, especially with our patients who are, you do have prediabetes or other forms of diabetes. So this is pretty lengthy. Um, However, if you're not familiar, diabetes, food insecurity, and social determinants of health um, really paint this picture of our whole person, okay? So when we're thinking about food insecurity, it is one bubble within um, economic stability. Uh, The Kaiser family, they put a, a food environment, right? So it falls into social determinants of health, and there's different layers. This is a really nice review on ways that we can look at food insecurity, Healthy people look at it with food, with economic stability, um, but we want to always think of the whole person and their food insecurity rather than, well, they're just food insecure and that relates to diabetes. We're also think of kind of that entangled web of how it's impacting those other items of social, social determinants of health. Um, so the biggest, I think that this, the Kaiser family puts out a nice picture. All of these are well-researched and have come up with really nice kind of that overall circle of social determinants of health, but economic stability, education on top of education isn't, um, I'm highly educated. It's communication, it's training, right? And so thinking outside of just our higher education alone, community and social context, 
um, stress is going to play a huge role in food insecurity and diabetes. If you're familiar with diabetes, which I'm sure all of us are, the higher stress level, the higher cortisol level, the more difficult it is going to be to um, manage those blood glucose values. The physical environment, the safety of our um, service members and our patients being able to access food, um, travel and get food. That is a huge component. Our health care system, um, various parts are obviously going to look a little different. Um, the hospital I work in now, the clinic and the hospital are connected. So there's kind of that nice envelope of quality of care because we're very familiar with the patients where that might not be the case where you're, you're located. But how can we continually connect our patients and our service members? And then our food environment, last but not least, um, access and just in general hunger is going to add another layer of social determinants of health. And if we have questions over any of this, you know, we can definitely dive in more. But there's a lot of layers to the social, social determinants of health. So quickly, um, well, not super quick. We have plenty of time. Um, what questions do you all have about food insecurity, how to start the conversation, and then how that relates to diabetes care, if you have any? Bailey, we haven't had any come in through the chat yet, Okay, um, but we will, the, the chat pod's open. So as she continues, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we will have another question break a little bit later in the presentation. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. All right. So now we're going to continue understanding how our service members and our patients were walking in their shoes with possible diabetes, food insecurity, and now we're adding another layer of defining the revisions of the diabetes standards of care. Um, this is something I try and review yearly as a professional in my sphere and where I work. Um, and a lot of the revisions are just adding layers, which is really nice. Some of them will see there's new definitions. Um, the beautiful thing about healthcare and the difficult thing about healthcare is things change very quickly. So the standards of care really allows, um, it's a huge huge panel of individuals and practitioners who work with diabetes. And then we're taking essentially research that has been done, therapy and treatment that has been done for the year. And then we're adding in um, really nice edits, essentially really nice revisions to what we already know. And then how can we improve upon our care? So this is just a glimpse. It's very long. <laughs> um, so hopefully we at least hit some of the detail points. And then if you have questions or or, um, are concerned about maybe a specific section. Um, there is the whole diabetes standards of care. It is free as well. Oh, I'm advancing the slides. Thank you, Tanya. Um, so we're really thinking the biggest revision of the summary is we're always using person first and inclusive language. So an example of that is we're thinking about instead of that person is diabetic, they're pre-diabetic. We're saying person with diabetes, person with gestational diabetes, and we're inclusive. So instead of saying, I still continually hear and kindly uh, recommend some of our providers to look at diabetes differently, um, it's not that our patients are uncontrolled and um difficult to manage and struggling, it's that they're just mismanaging or um, they're having a difficult time managing their diabetes rather than um, non-compliant is a really huge one that I see a lot. Um, non-compliant says um, we have said everything they need to say and they're just not doing it. And it's really, um, they're mismanaging for those related to those social determinants of health. And so really kind of changing how we view our patients with diabetes and how we view pa people with diabetes. Um, another big one that I hear a lot is, well, they, especially with type 2 diabetes, um, 
they did it they did diabetes to themselves which is never the case who who would um personally like to choose to do diabetes to themselves that's never the case um D, diabetes similar to all diagnosis we would even throw cancer in there um diabetes is a diagnosis and it is related to lifestyle but it is not something someone just automatically chose to um, happen to themselves right so just really thinking of that change so let's dive into section one it is very layered um, especially as it relates to food insecurity and so section one we're improving care and we're promoting health and specific populations so we added in from last year we added in different populations that maybe we work with or maybe um, we're around or surrounding and so that's kind of what we're looking at today so we're connecting I don't know if you you have ever worked with um, community healthcare workers or had the chance to work with healthcare workers. So I have um, in my very short time, but I, I work, like I said, in a, a rural area, um, but the WIC services, if you're stateside um, or if you're not, they, there are significant amount of community health workers who are able to kind of be the hands and feet of, or hands and feet, the, the, I mean, hands and feet plus eyes of our community. So if you're in a new community or you're not familiar with the community, this is a position, um, a full-time worker who is working with these underserved communities. Next, we're looking at the three items that can improve upon how we're approaching patient care with diabetes. So let's do some definitions quickly. So digital health, what we're going to dive into today more is technology. So we're thinking of ways to communicate with our patients outside of one-on-one -on -one, face to face using technology. Telehealth. People get telehealth and telemedicine confused, myself. So let's define them really quickly. Telehealth is a service provider, like a dietitian, can be a physical therapist, social worker, et cetera, who is improving upon through a virtual means health. Lastly, telemedicine is specific to our doctors and our DOs. Okay. So kind of adding in those layers and that's the whole way that we could slowly improve upon um especially you know if you work in areas with food insecurity you probably work in areas with food deserts so that is a great way to improve those resources and use those um, electronic medical records or means of communication outside of the one-on-one -on -one typical office visit if you will this is a really interesting and new topic that I think we all should be aware of, and it's called value-based payments, and it's with our Medicare patients. We're slowly going to hopefully start seeing um, essentially using the social determinants of health, improving the way that we analyze value-based care and patient care. So clinics and doctors and other service, you know, health service members the way that we one-on-one -on -one provide better care, there is going to be either sponsorship from different resources or the government um, or, you know, promotion as far as value-based care. And so it's kind of a unique way to look at healthcare. Um, could have some benefits, could have some downfalls, but I think it will be very interesting as we move forward. And then migrant and seasonal agriculture workers, how can we improve rather than um, push an arm away of you're only living here for a season, how can we improve health while you're here stateside or while you're here working in different areas? Um, I live in a farming community and there are a significant amount of migrant and seasonal workers. Um, and, you know, while we're meeting with them, um, what resources do you have rather than I think a lot of these patients get labeled as unpaid or self-paid. Okay, that's a lot of red flags of let's, you know, everybody medical team, let's jump on board and find resources while this patient is here for as long as they're here, rather than viewing that patient as they're going to be here for a short time, we could only provide so much. And lastly, language barriers. So 
non-English speakers um, will look different for all of us. But I think as the conversation continues, how can we improve the language barrier rather than um, your typical, let's just, you know, have education, let's communicate at a higher level, regardless of how that looks like. So our populations of concern for food insecurity as it specifically rates, relates to diabetes. Those that have food insecurity are higher likely to struggle with 20%, um, maybe up to 20% with diabetes. And the risk of type 2 diabetes, so not even diagnosis, but the risk of getting type 2 diabetes is twofold with food insecurity. So we're at a higher risk of being diagnosed with diabetes when we have food insecurity. So red flags should be going off when we're meeting with these service members, et cetera. Populations of concern, I feel like this can be for, similar to other diagnosis, but um, I see this pretty significantly when I'm practicing is older adults, which we're gonna discuss as far as diabetes care, individuals who are Latino, African-American, low income, going back to the social determinants of health, and then single mothers. So section one, as far as the subsection goes, we're looking at the reason there is such a high risk of food insecurity relating to treatment is we're seeing these extremes, okay? So anytime I see an extreme in the hospital or in the clinic, I am thinking there could be a risk, right? My red flags are going off. I have a patient that has severe hypoglycemia, um, may or may not be diagnosed with diabetes, but a lot of it is because we're either administrating um, a type of medication we've been diagnosed with and we're consuming too many or too little carbohydrates at a fast rate. And so we hear that huge drop and then we wind up in the hospital for acute care. And then under controlled hyperglycemia. So it is not severe, but we're thinking of foods that are inexpensive and carbohydrate rich processed foods. So this is not fresh fruits and vegetables, y'all. This is um, highly, um, highly processed foods. They're really inexpensive. We've maybe purchased at um, a convenience store or a corner store because we need food, but we just either don't know what to choose or we're at limited options and we're only consuming, you know, think ramen noodles, think crackers or um, think Coca-Cola, you know, Cokes, things like that, that are really high in carbohydrate risk foods, not balanced with other meal options. Binge eating because we now have food available. Financial constraints related to diabetes prescription, so um, improving upon hyperglycemia, and then also anxiety and depression. So a lot of our patients that may typically have issues with um, not getting out of bed, difficulties struggling with their diabetes, we're adding in another self-care layer of, um, I'll see a lot of my patients who, I'm just so tired of having diabetes. That's a really common um, term that I see. Or um, I'm taking my medications, nothing is changing. And so we're seeing a lot of this poor diabetes, but it's relating to, I'm just exhausted of on constantly taking care of myself or taking care of others. Okay. Taking care of family members, what have you, the household section two. Um, I'm going to quickly jump in and explain. We hopefully for the most part know the differences, but I myself as you know, a practitioner specifically with both type one and type two, we are continually seeing a misdiagnosis of type one and type two based on age. So that is a really something I have seen and I talk all the time with medical providers. These, it is not, um, we're not looking at pediatric diabetes versus adult diabetes. They are genetic and they're autoimmune, okay? Um, so autoimmune, we're looking at just specifically the destruction of beta pancreas cells. The way that we can assess another layer, say you have a 30-year-old or a 40-year-old and diabetes is continually progressing, we're continually seeing issues, we're obviously going to look at the whole person, but their lab values, um, the autobody, the anti-autobodies for type 1 diabetes, there's a nice really list. I don't have time to explain every single one. Um, and then there are other lab values related to type 1 diabetes that we can do in hospital and clinical settings. Um, so 
but all kind of slowly work out of our brains that it is age related and that is not the case. Type 2 diabetes, um, we're seeing a reduction in diabetes issues with diet, exercise, and medications. Okay. Um, type 1 diabetes, our individuals will always have diabetes and we won't see that extreme change in A1C um, without the influence of insulin at some point in time. Okay. And like I said, there's the C CRP and autoantibodies relating to type 1 specifically um, compared to type 1. Next is our section 3. Um, we're looking at specifically comorbidities and type 2 diabetes. So some of the interesting and I think great ways that have been revised is we are looking at individuals in a different way. So we're specifically understanding if our patients are prescribed specific medications relating to comorbidities, we're thinking they either are at risk or may need to be approached for type 2 in a different way. So individuals who have been prescribed statins, individuals who see insulin resistance and prediabetes, um, individuals will need and it may an intensive approach to a greater risk of type 2 diabetes. So if we have a patient with renal disease or um, heart disease or obesity, they are at greater risk for increasing, increasing risk for type 2 diabetes or um, the mismanagement of type 2 diabetes. So those are our patients, hey, they're in our hospital or they're in our clinic or we've, we're having conversations with them um, in an obviously an empathetic manner. We need to all hands on board because the faster that we can improve these comorbidities, the greater we're going to reduce the risk of kind of that repeat difficulty with comorbidities. Okay. And then pharmacological pharmacotherapy is looking at the whole picture of pharmacy and we're bringing in, which is so beautiful. We're not just thinking of pharmaceuticals themselves. We're bringing in weight management relating to nutrition. We're looking at hyperglycemia relating to nutrition and pharmaceuticals. And then we're reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease. So I always try and explain it this way. Diabetes all, all diabetes is not related to high or low blood glucose. It is related to microvascular and macrovascular destruction and difficulties relating to how blood glucose is running through um, our bloodstream. And so that damage, that damage of blood glucose in itself is why we're seeing cardiovascular renal disease related to the kidneys. So don't think, oh, well, they just have high blood glucose. And so that is what is causing diabetes. And it's not, it's the microvascular and the macrovascular damage that's causing retinopathy, neuropathy, et cetera. So we're really thinking outside of blood glucose alone, and we're thinking about that actual damage that occurs the longer that we're having these highs and lows of blood glucose. So hopefully that kind of helps. Section four, we're taking it a step further and we're looking at medical evaluation and assessment. So we provided a really great resource. Um, the standards of care specifically look at these three topics. And I think all of them really could have their own um, their own presentation, if you will. So when we're thinking about medical evaluation, we really want to think about health status, and then set goals off of that status. So if I have a patient who does have food insecurity, um, may have a difficult social CPS, I just had a patient like this recently, so I have a great example, may have a difficult um, home life, a CPS case may be involved, um, the patient can no longer take care of themselves, the service member can no longer take care of themselves in the home, or is being so overwhelmed to take care of others, their goals will look differently than our patients that are food secure. Do you have a financial support system? Do you have a familial and community support system? Those goals will look too, completely different, even if they have the same A1C and the same, um, you know, very similar as far as the difficulties with comorbidities. So we really want to think individual, and it does seem overwhelming, um, 
but there are many times where I will educate differently based on what is occurring in the actual external social realm rather than view this patient as a cookie cutter patient. So we're really diving in a little deeper. Age appropriate recommendations for vaccines, that obviously is a medical team approach. Um, but looking at the recommendations, discussing that with your patients, um, there is obviously an immune factor that plays a role in diabetes. So it's not another layer that we want our patients to, to struggle with. Um, but there's a lot of detail specifically in the standard of, of care as far as which vaccines as we're moving forward um, for specifically our older population, what's recommended compared to if they are diagnosed with diabetes. Um, and then following up, right, with that food insecurity layer, that low economic status layer, um, as we're doing that recommendation. Lastly, um, there is a huge concern in the team of NASH, um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, is really adding in the relationship that we're seeing between diabetes and lifestyle. So the team that wrote a really nice revision in the standards of care um, provides, essentially, you'll see a normal liver, excuse me, and a cirrhosis cancer liver, and then that NASH in the middle. So I think a lot of times um, when anyone is diagnosed with fatty liver disease, we automatically think, well, this patient has alcoholism or they struggle with alcoholism, et cetera. And that's not necessarily the case. It, it falls into that NASH, which is diabetes and lifestyle. And our liver is essentially, you know, making up for the lifestyle choices, making up for um, insulin resistance. So our liver is really taking a toll. Our patient's liver is really having a difficult time because we're working with um, that fat tissue. And luckily, when we approach diabetes and NASH together, we're really seeing um, improvements as far as patient care, improvements as far as um, our patient's overall diabetes management. But we have to think um, we're looking at NASH in a relationship to diabetes. And then we're looking at related to nutrition, exercise, safety of exercise, and pharmaceuticals, all of that combined. Section five is lengthy. However, <laughs> um, this, I could sit here and talk about section five all day long um, with my background and exercise and overall health. I think, um, man, if we could, you know, bread and butter, if we could approach every single patient in improving health behaviors and just overall well-being, it's kind of... Um, to me, it's that little like angel cloud, like this would be beautiful of how we can approach our patients. However, um, that's not the case. Sometimes we have a short amount of time. So it's our goal, right? To constantly facilitate these positive behaviors. So facilitating positive health behaviors isn't um, a cheerleader. It's what can our patients handle? And we are coaching our patients with a clinical view and our service members. We are approaching our patients with improving upon health behaviors and not health behaviors that are um, they're constantly struggling with. I have a patient specifically who continually consumes a higher amount of dietary fat and a higher amount of sodium. And this patient is at risk for, um, for diabetes and does live in a rural area and is food insecure. So this patient, however, is improving fiber intake. This patient is improving vegetable and fruit and whole grain intake. All at the same time, slowly trying to reduce the consumption of these other nutrition factors, such as dietary um, fat and um, sodium, that high, high levels of sodium and high levels of sweet tea. I live in Texas. So all of those, I'm not focusing on the things that we're having a difficult time with. I'm focusing on, wow, you are improving your fiber. Wow, look at you improving your hydration. Okay. So a different view. We're going back to the social determinants of hair, of care. We're looking at ways to deliver health care in a health, health, a telehealth manner. Our food insecure patients typically, not always, but typically we will see um, a difficult time in a food desert. And a food desert does not have to be in a rural area. Um, I lived in Waco, Texas, and 
the transportation alone put patients or you know put a community in in a food desert so do not always think that it's lengthy miles etc it can look in a city there can be a food desert um, because it's the lack of nutrient dense foods within you know a certain amount of area intermittent fasting and time restricted eating um as a dietitian, this is going to look at different for every individual, but they did add this in there as a way to slowly improve health outcomes. However, I will say, um, as someone who has worked with patients who this was recommended for, um, it does take a lot of hands-on work and it does take a lot of appointments, kind of going back to the health, telehealth view of patients that maybe your um, physician on staff, et cetera, would like to see this with a patient. Does it work? Absolutely. Does it take a lot of hands-on teamwork? Yes, it does. So that's just, um, you know, before we approach any specific diet, that's something we need to look at. And does it make sense for a patient, right? Um, especially related to food insecurity. Weight loss, um, so weight loss, anytime we're approaching this 15% weight loss to improve efficacy of medication, incredible that we can approach it this way. However, um, we're seeing a lot of pharmaceuticals out there that are extreme weight loss and we're seeing improved lab values. That is all great and fine. However, um, as a clinician who has worked in exercise phys physiology for quite some time and other ph exercise physiologists, the improvement of weight fat loss compared to muscle loss is going to be the best way for a patient's long term to reduce the risk of sarcopenia. I feel like that one's pretty obvious, but we really need to think long term. Okay. So when we're working with our medical team and they're saying we need this patient to lose weight very quickly, how can we at the same time improve muscle mass through protein, through dietary impact, things like that, rather than weight loss alone? Okay. Um, I feel like we've discussed supporting positive health behaviors and health behaviors is more than um, nutrition. It's going down to the next level. Next point is, are our patients sleeping safely? Um, how can we recommend our patients to specific sleep health, which is wild, but it's actually, you know, the reduction of constant stress, the improvement of reducing the constant need to be on with um, maybe a cell phone or a digital screen. So ways that we can promote healthy sleep, mental and behavioral health, refer, refer, refer. I can't say that enough. Um, if you worked around a mental behavioral health uh, provider, so incredible the work they're doing, um, very out of my ball game. If I have a patient that is, um, gosh, I had one last month, I'm really personally struggling and that's why I'm not sleeping, right? There's so many layers when we're looking at mental behavioral health. And I think we always hear as maybe like a trigger step, but it's not. Um, and then we're adding in our family and care, family and caregivers when necessary, when we think it's appropriate. But the faster we do that, the faster we're going to see improvements in overall diabetic care to have everyone on board and everyone involved in goal setting. Six, we're understanding glycemic targets. Again, this can be difficult to dive into with our patients who do have food insecurity. Um, but our glycemic targets is looking outside of the A1C. This um, average glucose report right here is looking at our target ranges. So the easiest and quickest way, because I don't want us to run out of time, is how much are patients in or below range for their diabetes blood glucose um, that is continuous, okay? So we're going to discuss the CGMs, the continuous blood glucose monitors here in a second, but we're thinking about the target range. We want our patients in target range greater than 50% of the time, and this is so, so important for people with food insecurity, less than 1% of the time below range, less than 1% of hypoglycemia risk, which is going to place them in the hospital at any given time, right? And then we're addressing these goals related to glycemic control. So the more our patients, even if they do not have a continuous blood glucose monitor, if they have a um, 
using a finger prick to assess their blood glucose, this is still a way that we can help them understand ranges because ranges can look, this is a really nice way, the continuous blood glucose monitor shows a really nice way to have time and range, but we can do this with a finger prick method as well and using a monitor by um, looking at a range from hour to hour. That's another way. So we don't always have to have a technology form that maybe is really expensive or difficult for a patient to access. We're just thinking of the ranges um, for a 24-hour window. What is your range? How often are you doing this range? Um, these patients can use, you know, an old-school blood glucose journal, things like that. So there are ways outside of um, a continuous blood glucose monitor that we can start the discussion of time and range rather than, oh, your A1C is 10 again, right? Let's look at the numbers. Let's help them understand where they're very high compared to what they're eating compared to, and this is where we'll involve a diabetes educator as well, but if you don't have access to a diabetes educator, um, being able to help our patients understand this is so important and really helps them um, understand how nutrition and their other lifestyle factors are relating to blood glucose. So next up is diabetes technology. Well, we will see this very commonplace. I'm excited to say um, the Diabetes Standards of Care has recommended that all individuals can be and should be, when appropriate, okay, when appropriate, be recommended to have a continuous blood glucose monitor. Um, so excited about this. I think we're going to see great improvements as far as diabetes care. Um, there's also great resources as far as using the different methods. There's three um, blood glucose continuous monitors out on the market today that are um, FDA approved. If you're familiar with them or if you're not, there is a monitor for Medtronic, the Dexcom, and then the Freestyle Libre. So they all have different um they're a little bit different in the way that they read, um, but they're all similar in the way besides um, one of them, the older style Freestyle Libre was not um, constant. So you would have to scan your your monitor, your um, cell phone to look at your, your range as um, it wasn't constantly telling your phone data, if that makes sense. Um, but if you are treated with basal insulin, so important, so we can reduce the risk of hypoglycemia and you're not over-administrating insulin types. Um, you're not interfering with specific substances as far as it can be anywhere from um, lifestyle choices such as drugs and alcohol, but we can also add in different substances as well as far as supplementation such as um, vitamin C, um, it's kind of silly, but like other resources of, um, sorry, I'm blanking on the specifics that are substance related to the CGM. Um, it'll come back to me, but vitamin C is one that can interfere weirdly if you take too much. Um, early initiation in real time is recommended for children and adults. So used to, a couple years ago, it was recommended that we wait. We wait till our patients really understand their diabetes to get a continuous blood glucose monitor. And that's not the case anymore. Our automated insulin delivery systems, the one that is on the market right now is the, of course, I'm going to blank on what it's called. Anyways, it's automated insulin delivery and it's a full loop system um, and it connects to the CGM. And then the inpatient CGM use for inpatient care, um, that's relating to any times our patients do have a CGM and also have to have a, um, a service professional, whether it be a nurse, doctor, um, diabetes educator, who is available and can help our patient during times where the patient understands their CGM and we also have a provider that understands their diabetes. Yes, I can wrap up really quickly. Um, lastly, um, obesity and type 2 man diabetes management. This is individualized. Pharmaceutical approaches, we're looking back at social determinants of health related to individualized treatment. Cardiovascular disease, I think we hit really well on our comorbidities, but adding in um, statin therapy and sodium glucose transporters. 
chronic kidney disease, one in three adults may have chronic kidney disease and have diabetes. And then lastly, our retinopathy, neuropathy, and foot care. We're looking at other factors outside of diabetes that may increase difficulties of the risk factors for retinopathy, neuropathy, and foot care. And older adults, understanding the different ways that our patients are using CGM. We're actually trying to reduce risk of hypoglycemia because that's the greatest stress for these patients. And management and diabetes, endorsing counseling, providing higher intense measures, and lots of support relating to weight management and breastfeeding. Diabetes in the hospital, our non-critical ill patients, like we just discussed, can use their CGM and automated insulin systems. And here are some great resources as far as individuals and food insecurity. Okay. I apologize. I got long-winded. <laughs> that was great. Thank you, Bailey. Thank you. Um, we appreciate your, you sharing your expertise and all of the resources that Bailey shared here on the last slide are also linked in a resource document that is um, located on the event page. So the same place where you've, you found the slides for today's presentation, you can find links to all of these resources as well. I don't see any um, questions in the chat, but if you do have questions, please type those in there. We still have some time that we can certainly get to, get to those questions. I would like to share an upcoming webinar opportunity. So the next webinar um, in the Food Security and Focus series is titled Supporting Military Teens, Community Healthy Living and Food Security Programs will be on Thursday, um, December 7th from 11 to 1230 Eastern, um, and continuing education credits are available for this session. The registration for that is linked um, here on the event page on this slide. In con um, continuing education information for this webinar, um, this webinar has been approved for one CPEU from the Commission on Dietetic Registration for registered dietitians and certificates of attendance are also available. To receive your continuing education certificate, um, we will post the evaluation link in the chat pod now. So you'll fill out the evaluation and then be directed um, to enter your email address to receive your CPEU certificate. You can also get the certificate from the event page. Um, you'll find the purple evaluation link at the very bottom of the event page. And again, after completing the evaluation, you will be directed to select the appropriate CE opportunity and fill in your name and email, and your certificate will be emailed to you. Sometimes the certificates are directed to a junk folder. So if you don't receive it, right away, make sure you check your junk folder and see if it's there. Um, but if you have any questions about your certificate, please contact me at the email listed on the slide, oneopnutritionwellness at gmail.com, and I can help you get your certificate. A recording of today's webinar will be archived within 48 hours to our YouTube channel, which you can access via the event page. And I did see one question come in, Bailey. Mm -hmm. um, what is the normal range for a, a person with diabetes? They've Perfect. heard it was from 70 to 145. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad we, said, um, we have that question because we didn't specifically look at treatment ranges for target ranges. So 100% individualized first and foremost. Um, some patients, it may be a difficult time to reach a target range, but ideally we want our patients to range between 70 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. Um, it actually needs to be um, higher than the 140 range um, because we're seeing a lot of benefits to allowing that closer to 180, but um, you could still have a beautiful um A1C improvements in overall lifestyle with 7180 is the current recommendation with the standards of care. Thank you. And another really good question just came in mm -hmm. too. Do you have any recommendations for those who rely heavily on government subsidized programs that give out foods that are high in refined carbohydrates mm -hmm. and any suggestions on how they can get more nutrient dense foods? 
Yes. So I'm so glad that was brought up because we really didn't look into specifics related to nutrition because the standards of care is so broad. But when we're thinking about a lot of our service members or patients that only have options with refined carbohydrates, we want to specifically add in foods that may be lacking. And so when we're looking at um, whole grains or um whole wheat items, right, that are higher in nutrient density. If our patients say they can only get white rice or white bread, et cetera, I am going to essentially assess what that whole grain goal was. And a lot of it is fiber and nutrients relating to iron, thiamine, and niacin. Okay. Um, so how can I find foods that have those options? A lot of times um, I have actually worked with um, some medical team members and we try and work with canned foods. We try and work with foods that are maybe shelf stable, such as um, canned fruit that is not added sugar. So try and get that fiber component outside of um, just a refined carbohydrate. So vegetables specifically is one way Um, improving the way that they're getting protein from those sources um, is you know, where you can look at different options that may or may not be shelf stable. So things like nut butters, um, food items that maybe like yogurt, dairy, et cetera, where I'm trying to replace some of that protein they also were getting. And then we always kind of want to model, even if our patients, I culturally have a lot of patients that they would not eat brown rice, right? And that's very typical today in our world is either we don't have the availability to whole grains or grains that uh, or carbohydrates specifically that are so highly refined. So we're just adding in layers that we want to replace and it's fiber, protein, and healthy fats. Well, that might add a layer of difficulty, um, we may need to think outside the box. How can we get a can of vegetables that we can rinse out some of that sodium component? Um, how can we look through, I mean, some of my, I've kind of had to get creative because I live in West Texas. So if my patient's going to stop at a truck stop, what are some recommendations they have when they're going through the aisles that I want to make sure they're getting those sources? Um, so nutrient dense I think also the portion sizing of those highly refined carbohydrates, not having those foods alone. So when they're, um, I always recommend with my patients, okay, you're eating this food, we're seeing a high trend, let's add in a food at the same time. And we're going to start to see that really nice up and down and not those huge spikes high and low. So um, I think we're making sure our patients are eating it with protein, fiber, and fat. Um, even, even if it doesn't look super healthy at the start. Um, We're trying to add in, maybe we can just continually edit the way that they're looking at those foods. So it it does take some time. It takes some creativity, but it's not impossible by any means. Um, Does that help? I can definitely clarify that a little bit more. That was good. Thank you for that insight. And one last question that just came in. What are the benefits of blood glucose being closer to 180 than 145? Mm -hmm. Are these benefits only for people with diabetes or are these benefits seen in people without diabetes as well? So people without diabetes, um, we typically don't see a ton of measurement of blood glucose um, unless we're actually going into the clinic. I know right now we're seeing a huge trend which I honestly could, that could be a whole different webinar of people without diabetes using glu- continuous blood glucose monitor. Um, but when we're seeing um, that 180, we're actually reducing the risk of these highs and extreme highs and lows. And it's actually placing our patients right into a nice target range um, rather than that extreme of 140, because it, it typically, it's going to actually increase the risk of diabetes distress because we're having to tightly, tightly manage blood glucose rather than this 180 is allowing for our patients to have a nice high and low between meals, a nice high and low, not high and low, a nice time and range between meals, a nice time and range overnight um, rather than, you know, Typically, we'd see that 140 where our patients are having to have extreme, I'm, these are the foods I am only available to have, and I am really over, you know, 145. Well, that that 40 point 
recommendation is causing more stress, which causing more difficulties than if we would just allow that to expand because we're always going to see even people without diabetes, we're going to see some spike after a meal um, and some, some increase of a glucose. And so it's just allowing our patients to have a little bit more less restriction and allowing our patients to have um, space to improve A1C related to how they're eating and how they're handling their pharmaceuticals. Thank you, Bailey. It's um, one minute until the end of our webinar, so we will wrap up. Um, thank you again, Bailey, for a great presentation, and thank you to thank everyone you. for your for your contributions in the chat. Be sure to visit us at our website, oneop.org, to explore upcoming events, articles, resources, and more. And you can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. We will stick around for just a little bit longer if you need to grab a link or information from the chat. And thank you all again for attending and we wish you a pleasant rest of your day.